Welcome to the history of operating systems for Info 1111 Linux 1. We're going to jump right into things here. Uh, many of the operating systems that we have um, come from a very common history. There used to be a lot of choices in operating systems back in the day. <clears throat> Particularly in 1970 to 1995, Windows was not the king of all desktop computers. Can you imagine that? There were things that existed before Microsoft Windows, and actually there were a lot of them. Windows did not actually become the number one desktop operating system until about 1995. Um, prior to that, we had tons of choices. So let's jump in. Let's talk about some of these other um, operating systems that existed back in the day. <clears throat> First one, um, these are just a few, but there were dozens. One is called the Tandy TRS-80. Look at it there with those old floppy disks all in one console there. These can be bought usually at Best Buy and other places. The Commodore 64, one of the first um, <clears throat> very popular computers that had color added into it. Um, and this was very popular, the Commodore 64, used by a lot of people for their as their home computer, just plugged right into your TV. The Atari. Atari is known for video games, but they also got into the computer industry. Their ST and their 400 system that is shown right there is were very popular as well. The Apple II was probably Apple's greatest uh, machine that they ever created. It lasted a long time. There are lots of revisions. Um, it was an improvement to their Apple I, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about more there. IBM had their own operating system. To kind of combat uh, DOS and Windows, they came up with OS2, and that was another popular system. Finally, DOS. Right, uh, people have heard of DOS and only know of DOS as a command line type of operating system, which it is. Um, but many people don't know that there were several versions of DOS that were out there. There were dozens, and uh, Microsoft DOS was just one of them that ran on PCs and everything else. <clears throat> so let's continue on. So you may be thinking at this time, like, what happened? We had so many different computers, so many different operating systems out there. Consumers had lots of choices. Well, what happened? Like, you know, the only choice you think you have right now, many students think they go out, the only choice they have is to go to a store and you can pick from a Windows machine, right? You can pick a Dell or an HP or an Asus or Lenovo, pretty much they're all the same thing, right? Just from different hardware vendors and things like that. And that's pretty much our choice, unless you want to spend lots of money for an Apple system. And some people really like Apple and think that that's a value for their money. Um, but those are kind of, that's what you get, a Windows system of some kind and an Apple system. We still have some options in computing today. So let's review some of those and let's review some of their history. Now, what we do need to understand is that some of these operating systems intertwine and intermingle a little bit. The four that we're going to be looking at is Unix, which has been around a long time, came before all the others, and a lot of them are built off that. Mac OS is one of them that are built off that. We have Windows and we have Linux. Four dominant operating systems that are still around today and still heavily used. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these operating systems are interwoven. They borrow ideas from each other and go like, oh, I like this or I like that. Hey, I'll include this, things like that. A lot were built off each other. As you'll see, Unix and Mac OS have a shared history. Windows and Apple have a shared history as well and have mixed and borrowed ideas as well. And Linux has borrowed ideas from all of them as well to hopefully come up with the computing systems that we have today. So let's begin. <clears throat> Unix. Unix was a solution to the problem that faced computers back in the 1960s. Back then, computers were massive computers that took up an entire room and um, didn't have much more computing power than uh, your calculator or your watch. These were designed from the ground up. IBM would bring in literally a semi-truck unload these huge cabinets, which were your computer, and you would have to program everything from scratch. There is no operating system. There are no programs. There are no games. There is nothing. You had to wire in there and you had to program everything from scratch. You had to build all the drivers, everything else. And everybody 
who received one of these computers had to all build them up from scratch. So if company A got this computer and then company B got the exact same computer, you would have two different programmers and engineers working on them and they would come up with two completely different operating systems and programs and ways to interact with them and everything else. So Unix sought out to solve that problem. And in 1969, two really bright, brilliant guys, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, came up with Unix. Uh, they programmed this just within a few weeks. They, came, they had a few different versions. Thompson, Ken Thompson, he created the B programming language, which later became the C programming language, as we learned before. The C programming language is what Windows, Mac, Linux, and Unix was all developed in, and he created that programming language. It is still a dominant language today and its predecessors like C++. They created something called the Universal Operating System, Unix. They created it on a computer called a PDP-11, and this allowed them to take an operating system and install it on more than one computer. That way, if you made a program in C on this computer, you could take it and recompile it on this other computer that's also running Unix, and voila, you've, you've been able to solve this problem and you can run that program on multiple computers. Now, Ken Thompson, who worked at AT&T Labs in 1974, went to go teach for a while at Berkeley University. While at Berkeley, he met this brilliant young student, Bill Joy. And Bill Joy uh, was blown away by Unix. And he was a brilliant guy. He created lots of things. He ended up eventually creating his own version of unix called bsd berkeley software distribution named after the college he also helped unify and open um, networking by helping create the tcp ip protocol that basically runs in you know ip addresses and port numbers that was him he helped create that and that was first built and designed on Unix in a BSD version of Unix. He also helped wrote the first text editor, well, one of the early text editors, uh, or one of the better ones, uh, called VI. Uh, we're going to be using VI in this class, or it's more modern version called Vim, that all started back from what this guy created. He loved Unix so much that in 1982, he created his own business called Sun Microsystems, which is also the company that created the Java programming language, which he was instrumental of. Sun Microsystems, unfortunately, doesn't exist anymore. They were sold and bought by Oracle, which is a database company. But they created their own version of Unix called SunOS and later was called Solaris. Now, today, there are lots of different versions of Unix. These are just a few, a few of the dates that they came out. That little demon up there is the BSD uh, mascot there and free BSD mascot. The Apple operating system, Mac OS, as we'll find out, is built off Unix. The kernel is Unix based. And so we, if you're running an Apple machine, you are running a Unix machine. That is one version of Unix that is out there. So it is still alive and well. It is still running on several servers um, and it helps run the internet. Now let's go ahead and look at Apple. Apple began back in 1976. Steve Jobs was there on the right. Steve Wozniak, the two Steves, is there on the left. Steve Wozniak is a little less known than Steve Jobs, but he was the brains behind everything. He's the guy that actually created the first Apple, the Apple II. He was the engineer. He was the programmer. Steve Jobs knew how to program a little. He wasn't very good at it. But what he was good at was innovation and marketing. And so he was more of the business side of things. They created and built these little Apple Ones in Steve Jobs' garage. They, he went to a small um, Radio Shack type company, hobbyist type of business, and they sold 200 units of the Apple One. And that's how they got started. In 1977, the Apple II was a huge success, sold over 50,000 units, and it cost about $5,000 today. This is what I grew up in the 80s that was in our school, was these Apple IIs. Uh, they were very popular and used for years and years and years. 1979, Steve Jobs went and visited Xerox. Xerox developed this graphical user interface with this GUI. 
it was the first time Steve Jobs ever saw this. It was, wasn't introduced. Xerox has kind of contributed for helping develop these graphical interfaces was the first one, but they didn't see a use for it, right? They were a uh, copy machine company, right? But Steve Jobs saw this and goes, no way. You can actually run two programs at once and you can overlay windows and have multiple programs open at once. And you can have these cool graphics and this is what's going to make computers easy for the average person. Steve Jobs saw that. So he kind of worked a deal with Xerox. Uh, Xerox wasn't too happy with him and later sued him because they thought they got ripped off. But anyway, they borrowed that GUI and started working and putting it onto their computers. Now, to be able to get Xerox's graphical interface onto Apple's machines, they actually hired Microsoft to help them with that implementation. And so Microsoft actually worked for Apple for a while. Now, in 1985, Steve Jobs got fired from Apple. Yes, the company that he started. This was due to a few things. It was poor sales. The Macintosh computer didn't sell as, as big as it was. But also, Steve Jobs had this little pet project called the Lisa, where he was going to create the greatest computer that ever existed at the time. And it was. It was a great computer. It was super fast. It was decked out. Thing is, it was so good, it cost 10 thousand dollars this is in 1985 um and so it was a huge bomb because of its cost uh hardly sold anything and so they fired him from his own company but steve jobs didn't stay down very long while he was away he started two other businesses the first company was a company you may have heard of called pixar uh that created the toy story movie uh, Pixar was later sold. It was not part of Disney originally, not until 2006 when Disney ended up buying Pixar from Steve Jobs, which uh, gave him another pretty penny. The other business that Steve Jobs started was a company called Next Inc. Now, this was his revenge, right? He was going to overtake and bring down Apple because they fired him by starting this new computer company with a brand new operating system that was built on top of Unix. So what he would do is take the Unix uh, kernel and called Darwin was the name of the kernel and he would build this awesome graphical interface over the top of it and it was going to put Apple out of business. Um, and we'll see what happened there. However, in the 1990s, without Steve Jobs running the company there, Apple was on financial collapse. They were about to fall into bankruptcy and be no more. We were that close to Apple not existing anymore back in the 90s. So in 1996, they begged Steve Jobs to come back to his old job, which he did. And when he did, one of the first things he did was, hey, you know that company I started next? We're going to buy that company next and we're going to integrate it into Apple and we're going to get rid of the old Apple systems that you guys developed when I was gone and we're going to bring in this new next computer with the next step operating system and we're going to put it on the Apple system and we're not going to call it next step anymore. We're going to call it Mac OS X and that will be our new operating system based off of Unix and that was the eMac. And that was a huge success. It helped save um, Apple, plus a few other things <laughs> did. Some of the achievements that Apple had um, are some of these uh, devices that we're all familiar with. Um, Apple actually earns most of their money through the iPhone and iTunes um, sales that occur. And that is those part of their largest revenue to make them one of the richest companies in the world now. Now let's talk about Microsoft. Microsoft started a year before Apple. Apple grew bigger uh, earlier. Uh, Microsoft took its time to grow, but it was started by Bill Gates, which most people know, but others don't know Paul Allen, who was a great guy and a great programmer and who helped start Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft became very popular because they developed the basic programming language, which was supposed to be a programming language that all people the most common average user could be able to um, learn very quickly and be able to develop and create programs. Now in 1980, uh, Microsoft was contracted by Apple. This is how they first started their partnership between Apple and Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft created something called a soft card for the Apple II. Now, a lot of businesses didn't run Apple machines, but Apple really wanted to get into the business world, but they couldn't run some of the business programs and applications. 
So what happened was, is Microsoft developed the soft card, which you can then put into your Apple II machine, which would allow you to now run the business programs that need to be run, like spreadsheets and other things. So this was the beginning of the Apple par Microsoft partnership, and this helped bring Apple into the business world. Um, it was because of this partnership that Apple, that Apple decided to bring Microsoft on later to help them develop their graphical interface to adapt the, um, the Xerox graphical interface to Apple. Now in 1991, uh, Microsoft started increasing. They met with IBM. They were still just the small little software company. And IBM was gonna release a personal desktop, a PC that they wanted to compete with Apple. And so you see how Microsoft's working for Apple, they're working for IBM, the competition. However, at IBM needed an operating system that would be usable for the average person. And Microsoft said, hey, we have an operating system. And guess what? They didn't have an operating system, but they go, we'll have one in, in a short time. So they left and they went out and they looked upon all the different versions of DOSes that were out there. And they found this guy in Seattle, Washington, who had something called an 86 DOS version. And so they paid him $75,000 and he was all ching. Thank you. Cause he was some guy who lived um, in his basement or something like that. And um, then Microsoft walked back a few days later, went to IBM and go like, hey, look at this cool operating system that we made. And it's called MS-DOS, not 86-DOS. And so they sold it to IBM for almost a million bucks, $860,000. But they go like, hey, if we're selling this to you, we get to also sell this to your competitors, right? The Dells and the HP and the other people out there. And they're all like, yeah, yeah, sure. We don't care about them. We're IBM. We're awesome. And so um, this allowed Microsoft to now sell to all their competition. In 1995, uh, Windows, Microsoft released their first Windows 1 with a GUI on it. Um, they got it working after they got this idea, after working with Apple and Apple's GUI. In 97, they released Windows 2.0. And in 1990, 1988, Apple sued Microsoft for copying their GUI because they thought it was really weird that Microsoft came worked for Apple, helped them with their GUI, and now they go back and Windows and Microsoft have their own GUI, which looks very similar to Apple's GUI. And so Microsoft thought that, or Apple thought that was really weird and sued Microsoft. Microsoft won, by the way. 1995, now this is really where Microsoft took off. Microsoft was slowly growing and becoming a, a big player, but up until 1995, as we learned earlier, Microsoft really wasn't that big. Um, there were a lot of other choices out there, but Windows 95 was the thing that really got them going. And Windows 98, by the time Windows 98 came out, 95% of all desktop uh, computers were Windows and were Microsoft computers. Now, the reason for this massive growth was, if you remember the history of Apple, was in the 90s, Apple wasn't doing so hot. They were practically bankrupt. Microsoft actually had to come in, and for a time there, Microsoft owned a portion of Apple because they contributed so much money to them and helped financially fund them. Not out of the kindness of their heart, but because... Microsoft was getting in trouble from the government for some of their um, business practices, which we'll talk about here soon. So that's one reason, decline of Apple. The surge of the internet definitely helped. Windows 98, but monolistic tactics, right? A monopoly is when one company controls everything, and they can because they're the biggest, and they squash all the other competition and don't give them a chance. Because of that, in 1998, Microsoft abused some of their abilities. They were investigated by the Department of Justice. There's a picture there of Bill Gates testifying before Congress about their abuse of their monopoly power and misleading statements and claims and unfair marketing strategies for all these people because they were kind of, right, working each other's competition and, and um, doing some things. So the big controversy was around the internet, which was up and rising at this time. And Netscape Navigator was the big browser at the time, which was not Microsoft-owned. That was its own company. And everyone 
who would run Microsoft would download and use Netscape Navigator because it was the better browser at the time. However, Microsoft uh, did not like that and used some of their uh, monopoly power to uh, force other businesses or mislead them into using their Internet Explorer. And that Internet Explorer needed to be installed by default on all the systems that were sold with Windows. That was some of the, the legal issues that was going on. Um, as a side note there, Netscape Navigator did die, but was reborn as Firefox later on and lives today as Firefox. Now today, Microsoft um, is a different company than it was back in the 90s. They love Linux. Hmm, we haven't even talked about Linux. According to an interview that we heard from Steve Bomber on a podcast in 2017, he said that only 11% of computing actually happens on Windows machines. This is a big influence because now a lot of computing has transferred over to phones. You know, all your social media stuff is done on phones. All your average computing is done on phones. Even some of your gaming is done on phones and there's no Windows phones anymore. Um, it's all either Android, which is Linux, by the way, or your iPhone, right? And all the servers and the internet mostly run off Linux and Unix. Microsoft has done is they created this great service called Azure Clouding Services. However, 60% of Azure, which is a Microsoft product, runs Linux. They've also invested lots of money into being able to install Linux within Windows. So you can actually use Linux at the same time you're running Windows using something called WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux. And uh, you can research more on how to do that and get it running on your Windows system if you're interested in that. Now let's talk about Linux here. Linux um, began before Linux even was thought of in 1977 with a man right there with the beard. His name is Richard Stallman. He's a very interesting fellow, very passionate about what he believes in. He was working for MIT. He wanted to print to that big printer down there, that Xerox machine. No, notice how Xerox keeps popping up here. However, their printer kept getting jammed. He wanted to fix it, so but he needed the printer drivers to be able to fix it. So he needed the programming code, the source code for those printer drivers. He contacted Xerox and says, hey, let me have your, your codes and I can fix your printer from always jamming. And they said, um, no, you're trying to steal from us. That's our that's our uh, intellectual property and we can't let you have that. And he goes like, dude, I'm trying to help you. But that's no good. And so he got a little upset. He believed that all software should be free, as in freedom, not necessarily free as cost, meaning you should be able to do with software whatever you want software to do, right? That software shouldn't just be restricted and closed and um, not shared, but it should be shared because that's what makes software better. Inside of that, he created two organizations. He created the GNU Foundation and the Free Software Foundation to promote those ideas. And as part of that, he created a software license called the GPL, General Purpose License, version 2 which was uh, the more popular one. There's a version three out now, but within the version two, he identified four software freedoms. So any software developed under the GPL or this license would need to follow these four freedoms. You should be able to run programs for any purpose. If you wanna run a program to build a laser, you should be able to, even if the program is to do something else, right? You should be able to do with it whatever you want. The next freedom is to you should be able to open and study and adapt it if you need it. So if a program is doing something you don't need it to do or you want it to change, you should be able to go into the code, change it and have it do what you want it to do. Right. Isn't that great? The next freedom is that it should be freely redistributed. So you should be able to send it out and share it with other people and exchange it with other people. How else are you going to get the code? And finally, you should, should be open to improve and release to the public. So you should be able to take that code that's freely distributed, make changes to it, and then send it out to people. So those are his freedoms. Those are all built into his general purpose license right there. And you can, if you code your software and you believe in these freedoms, you can license your software under those freedoms. Now, Salman wanted to build an operating system called the GNU operating system or HERD. This was really hard to do. Making an operating system is hard. 
<clears throat> and they are still kind of working on it. You can still download it and use it. It's not great. It doesn't have a lot of drivers. They're still kind of working on it. He realized that this was going to be a long time project. And he figured too, that if you have an operating system, you may also need some programs to go along with it because an operating system or a kernel all by itself doesn't do much unless you have programs to run on it, to browse the internet, to play games, to do something else, right? So he started building all these programs because he goes, once we have our operating system ready, we'll have all these other programs already ready for it, and then it'll be up and running, and people want to use it because we have all these cool programs. So there's a list of some of the programs there, everything from games to photo editors to the C compiler to a web browser, that IceCat web browser to a chess game. And there's tons and tons. And there's a web link there you can check and see all the GNU software that's out there that's free and open source and everything else. Now, 1991, this is where Linux history uh, starts to come together. From this student, this man on the left, his name is Linus Torvalds. He's a college student at the University of Helsinki, and he wanted to run Unix on his laptop, but he couldn't afford it. Unix was so expensive. And so he started using something called Minix, which was kind of this broken, um, for educational purposes only type of Unix operating system. But it was disappointing and it didn't work and have all the capabilities he wanted. So he started from scratch and he created something that worked like Unix, but wasn't Unix. It had no Unix code in it whatsoever, but he modeled how it worked after Unix and he ended up calling it Linux and he did it just for fun. He thought it would just be this little activity that he did during his Christmas break, right? He created it just for fun. Uh, one thing you need to know is that the Linux is just the kernel. Everything else is something else, which we'll talk about here. And he put it out on the internet and it blew up. It went viral. People from all over the world, programmers, started contributing to it and go, hey, here's some code that you can add to your kernel. Here's more code. Here's this. You can add this to your operating system. And on and on and on. And he goes, this is great. And so it was this very collaborative thing from people all over the world who are helping and contributing to Linux. Um, however, Linux is just a kernel. Didn't have any programs. Um, so what he did, he goes like, oh, well, this GNU people, they have all these programs. So I will have my Linux kernel and I will get all those GNU programs and I will mash it together. And now I have a kernel and I have programs that run on top of that kernel. And I really like Richard Stallman's GPL version two. I like his freedoms, his four freedoms. So I'm going to license Linux under that. So people can copy Linux and redistribute it and make changes to it. So now we have an operating system and we have all these programs. He basically did what Stallman couldn't do with an operating system, but took a lot of Stallman's ideas and his programs that helped make Linux what it is today. These are some facts about Linux. It is written in the C programming language, like all the others. It has six or 10 million lines of code. It is popular from tons of businesses. Most businesses use Linux in some capacity. Google, Amazon, Union Pacific, First Data, Toyota, on and on of companies that use Linux regularly. In 2002, Microsoft did spend $421 million to try and stop the spread of ink of Linux. This was back in the day when they didn't like Linux and saw it as a competitor. They were really worried that a free system might um, topple them. Now on the desktop market, most people are not running Linux on their laptop or computer, but some are like I do, like I am right now um, filming this presentation. I use Linux every day for everything, but that's not the majority of the people, right? However, 80% of the internet and the web servers out there are running Linux. So it is huge. Also, Android is probably the largest implementation of Linux. Android is the largest phone operating system out there. And all the Android phones are Linux and based on Linux. The largest number of contributors of any software project. That means that there has not been another software project that has had more programmers and contributors to it than Linux. That's how big Linux is, in case you've never heard of it. Now, what what um, you guys haven't heard of Linus Torvalds, what is he doing now? Well, he works for the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation pays his check 
The Linux Foundation is a nonprofit that promotes the use of Linux. They want people to use Linux. So they are supported by other businesses who contribute to them. Some of the businesses that support the Linux Foundation is Google, Amazon, Toyota, and Microsoft even is a, um, a sponsor of the Linux Foundation. Linux approves, uh, Linus, sorry, that should be Linus approves or rejects additions to the Linux kernel. So that's his job. He gets people contributing, going, hey, add this to your kernel. And he's all, all right. And then somebody else comes and said, hey, add this. And he says, nope, I don't like that. And so he's, he's the final say on what gets added to the official version of the kernel or not. Now, what if you want something added to the kernel and Linus says no? Well, go ahead and take it and add it yourself. <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome to do that. Linus, uh, Linux is not only his uh, fame to claim, he is also famed or known for creating the Git version control application that's out there. That is probably the number one version control application um, used by developers today. So he also did that. Now, um, since Linux is free, it is uh, available to modify and to use. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of versions of Linux that are out there because anybody can take it, modify it, and distribute it how they want to. So these are some versions and some popular ones out there. Some you may have heard of, Red Hat, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Linux Mint Arch are all very popular ones that you can run on your computer and on your desktop or your laptop. If you're interested in this, you can go to distrowatch.com, which is right there. I can take you there. You can see, which demonstrates this is it right here. Not a very fancy website, but it keeps track of all the versions of Linux that are out there. In fact, it actually has a newsletter that they do weekly where they review different versions of Linux, give you updated news on Linux. Um, they kind of track the most popular versions of Linux. Uh, this is most popular based upon this page and who clicks here. So maybe not the most popular usage um, case. Uh, Pop! OS is another great Linux. Manjaro is the one I use. But anyway, you can research, view, and see different types of versions of Linux from here. By the way, for this class, we'll be using CentOS, which is based on Red Hat Linux in this class. So to kind of summarize things, um, we used to have lots of choices in computing, but because of unfair business practices or just poor planning by some of these other companies, consumers, and a lot of those choices have gone away. However, we still have choice today. You can go buy Unix. You can install FreeBSD on your laptop. You can install Linux on your laptop. You can actually buy laptops with Linux from Dell and from HP. They kind of hide it on their website, but it's there. Um, you can buy them from other manufacturers and makers. So these are that there are other options out there for you if you like. Um, a lot of these operating systems, as you've seen, have borrowed ideas from each other. They've shared ideas with each other. They've straight out copied each other. They've stolen from each other and built off each other. So they have kind of this interwoven history with each other. I hope this has been informative to you. I hope um, this helps and that you've learned something about the history of operating systems.